Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Europe podcast, available every morning on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It's Thursday, the 11th of April in London. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up today, counting down from six, traders wind back Fed cut bets for the year as focus moves to Lagarde and the ECB. US intelligence sources tell Bloomberg they expect an imminent missile strike on Israel by Iran and its proxies. Plus, building momentum, UK surveyors say they're in increasingly optimistic about the outlook for property prices. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. Investors are rapidly unwinding bets on how many rate cuts they're expecting from the Federal Reserve this year after March's hotter-than-expected inflation data. Traders now see the Fed just cutting twice in 2024, with the first reduction pushed back from June to September. Month-on-month core CPI rose by a faster-than-expected 0.4% last month. JP Morgan's chief global strategist David Kelly says the writing's on the wall for cuts in the coming months. The sound that you heard there was the door slamming on a June rate cut. It's, uh, that's gone. It's definitely more inflation than the Fed wants. I still think that they ought to normalise rates o- o- over time. I'd, I'd be happy enough if they started start to cut rates in June. Uh, but I think this means that they won't. David Kelly says his current base case is for two cuts this year, one in September and one in December. It was the third month in a row of higher than expected underlying US inflation and followed a strong month of job creation in March. Benchmark 10-year Treasuries reacted to the news surging above 4.5% for the first time since November. That US inflation surprise also has traders second-guessing the European Central Bank's rate path. The chance of a first quarter point move in June has now fallen to around 80% after being fully priced in just last week. Speaking hours before that US CPI print, Goldman Sachs' chief economist Yari Stenth made the case for what many still see as a June cut by the ECB. I think the cut in June um, is very likely. Um, And the debate now really is shifting towards the pace. We have strong evidence that policy is restrictive. I think uh, we are gaining confidence that inflation is coming back to 2%. Well, we'll have a better sense of whether Yari Stent's view is still the base case for many when the ECB President Christine Lagarde speaks later today. Euro area officials are expected to hold interest rates steady at today's meeting, but have signalled rate readiness to start easing in the coming months. Bloomberg Economics has upgraded its global economic growth forecast for this year with a warning that central bank rate cuts may be delayed. Our economists are expecting an expansion of 2.9% in 2024. That's slower than last year, but better than they had forecast last December. Advanced economies are seen ending the year with inflation around 2.5%. The UK is expected to grow by 0.2% this year, slightly lagging the euro area's expected expansion of 0.5%. Now away from economics to geopolitics. The United States and its allies believe Iran or its proxies will strike targets in Israel imminently. Bloomberg has learned that intelligence sees the targeting of government or military facilities as more a matter of when, not if. Iran's threatened attack on Israel would be retaliation for airstrikes in Damascus last week that killed senior Iranian military officials. President Biden says that Israel's security, however, remains a U.S. priority. Our commitment to Israel's security against these threats from Iran and its proxies is ironclad. Let me say it again, ironclad. We're going to do all we can to protect Israel's security. Despite the firm words on Iran, the U.S. leader has publicly grown more frustrated with Benjamin Netanyahu's handling of the war on Hamas. Chinese inflation is stalling, putting pressure on the yuan and threatening growth. The country's consumer prices have barely budged from a year ago. Bloomberg's Brian Curtis has more from Hong Kong. The CPI rose a tenth of a percent in March from the prior year. The estimate was for a gain of four tenths of a percent. In the meantime, producer prices slumped even further, underscoring deflationary pressures in the Chinese economy. Factory gate prices down 2.8 percent from a year earlier, extending a falling streak for the 18th consecutive month. The price slowdown suggests that China may not get much help from local consumers to meet the government's growth targets. In Hong Kong, Brian Curtis, Bloomberg Radio. 
Here in the UK, property surveyors are the most optimistic about buyer demand that they've been in over a year. According to a report from the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, UK home sales could see an upward surge over the next few months as prospective home buyers bet on lower interest rates. The supply of available properties is also increasing, but the professional body is also warning that activity will still be relatively limited due to high mortgage rates. One of Thames Water's key bondholders says any nationalisation could spark contagion risks for the whole sector. Britain's largest utility company is still locked in crunch talks with its stakeholders and the government. James Wilcock has more. Shalin Shah says investment in UK infrastructure is at risk if bondholders get a raw deal. The warning from the senior fund manager at Royal London comes as a debate rages behind closed doors between the regulator, shareholders, the government and creditors. The question? Who should take financial responsibility for the utility giant's management and £16 billion of debt? It's worth saying Shah has a fair bit on the line. Thames Water Bonds account for 2% of his Royal London corporate bond portfolio, according to the latest filing data on Bloomberg. Thames Water declined to comment on Shah's interview, but his words are a sign that holders of debt in the utility are getting increasingly rattled about the likelihood of carrying the can. In London, James Alcock, Bloomberg Radio. And those are our top stories this morning. On the markets right now, the MSCI Asia Pacific Index is down three tenths of 1%. Eurostock's 50 futures are also nudging lower. Uh, but it's the 10 year Treasury yield that is of most note this morning ahead of the ECB rate decision. US yields trading at 4.53%. Those are the markets. Well, in a moment, we'll be digging into the latest for central banking ahead of today's ECB decision and that uh, hotter than expected US inflation print. We'll also be bringing you more details details on Bloomberg's reporting of a possible escalation in the Middle East, the imminent threat of Iranian missile or drone strikes on Israel. Our Israel Bureau Chief Ethan Bronner will be with us with the details of that. But another story that caught our eye this morning, we're thinking about the jobs outlook, is McKinsey starting hundreds of job cuts here in the UK. Yeah, so 360 jobs to go. Why? Client demand is slowing down. There was a big consultancy boom in the pandemic if you remember. Now McKinsey Kinsey, though, cutting headcount, but at least in a fairly narrow field, uh, it's the experts, the specialist technical sort of advisors, so not the kind of mainstream um, consultants who are are going. And of course, McKinsey has tens of thousands of employees, but it's still quite a significant number. Yeah, certainly very interesting to keep an eye on what's happening in that sector. Let's get back, though, to our top stories. And traders have paired bets on ECB interest rate cuts after US core consumer price inflation beat expectations for a third month in a row. The the chance of a first quarter point move in June fell to about 80%. This as bonds across Asia fell sharply today. US Treasuries recovering slightly, but the 10-year yield still up by 18 basis points over 4.5%. Joining us now for more details is Bloomberg Opinion columnist Daniel Moss. Dan, great to have you with us on the programme this morning. The stakes for the ECB have gone up. Can Europe afford to delay rate cuts? I'm not sure they can afford not to proceed. Let's put it that way. Unlike the situation, the Federal Reserve, you've had numerous ECB policymakers handicapping specific months quite openly, like June. Two other points to make. One is that the European, the, the Eurozone economy is in far weaker shape than the United States, which is just showing great resilience, contrary to what people predicted for large parts of last year. Okay, there is no US recession. There's no sign of it imminently. Big economies within the Eurozone, like Germany, have had a tougher time. So that really strengthens the case for an ECB cut from an activity point of view. And thirdly, They've talked so much about June and they always say, well, you know, we make our decisions independently. We don't just react to what's going on in the US. Well, okay, so go ahead and cut in June. (laughs) Well, the other question is, can the ECB then deliver multiple cuts? Because that's the other view of the markets here in Europe is that there should be multiple cuts on the ECB. And the Fed now is only pricing two. A lot of this stuff is at the margin. So let's just game out a potential ECB reduction 
in June and let's say there's another in September and another in November or December, that would be three. If the scenario now is the Fed does two, there's not such a large divergence there. It's not like at this point, the Fed's going to resume hiking and the ECB is going to be cutting. That is a situation without a lot of precedent. I don't see that happening. Let's talk about that data print from the US that sort of upset the, well, slightly upset the apple cart on where things go next. Gets upset you. Tell us why. Look, it appeared as though inflation was slowly but steadily coming down. Uh, That descent appears to be somewhat stalled, at least from an optics perspective. Uh, If you were mindful to push for a reduction in June, uh, it makes your job that much harder now. Now, look, it's important to remember this is not the end of the world. The Fed's target of 2% inflation over time comes from PCE. It's a different indicator. The PCE has come down dramatically to around 2.5% from more than 7% during inflation's peak. So there has been some real success here, but we're just sort of seem to be bumping along this floor uh, that's proving uh, pretty resistant. Mm. I also suspect part of Jay Powell's challenge is, is how they've talked about rate cuts. You know, so... If you look at the last couple of times that interest rates have come down, so in 2019 was more of a mid-cycle adjustment, but they came down dramatically in 2008, they came down dramatically in 2020. So when people think of cuts, they think of a weak economy. So that's not what we have in the US. So I keep going back to a remark which Powell has made at his last couple of press conferences, which is, quote, we are well into restrictive territory, unquote. So policy can still be restrictive, but ease up a little if you believe we are well into restrictive territory. And I think this is where, you know, the communications problems start to come in. Yeah. Daniel, thank you so much for being with us. Bloomberg Opinion columnist Daniel Moss then on the stakes for the ECB and, of course, uh, his conclusions from the US CPI report yesterday. Next to a significant piece of Bloomberg reporting this morning, the US and its allies believe major Iranian missile or drone strikes against Israel may be imminent. This is according to people familiar with intelligence reports. On Wednesday, Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei vowed to punish Israel for an attack on Syria, while the Israeli foreign minister Israel Katz responded that his country would respond if attacked by Iran. Joining us now for more details, Bloomberg's Israel Bureau Chief Ethan Bronner. Ethan this would be a significant escalation in the war in the Middle East. What has Bloomberg learned in this reporting? Bloomberg has learned that the U.S., uh, its mili- its intelligence services have come upon some fairly strong indication that Iran plans to do something serious against Israel very soon. And it, it, the Israelis, of course, have been saying that as well. This is in retaliation for an attack that is presumed to have been done by Israel about 10 days ago uh, in Damascus on a diplomatic compound uh, in which uh, uh, seven uh, people were killed. The the key point there was that the, the two of the people were uh, Revolutionary Guard commanders. That is to say, Iranian commanders of militias in in uh, Lebanon and Syria. So that by itself, you could say that the, that was where the uh, escalation began. Uh, the and the Iranians have said aloud they're going to come back at Israel. So everyone is kind of waiting. Yes. So waiting. Put it into context for us, though. Why now? Why this escalation now? Why the acuteness of it? Well, I mean, this, of course, all goes back to the October 7th attack by Hamas, another Iranian-backed, armed and funded militia. Uh, uh, Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th. And the result of that was that uh, several hundred thousand Israelis, both in the south along the border with Gaza and in the north along the border with Lebanon, uh, abandoned their homes. And Israel feels that it can't 
let allow them to go back until something is done, quote unquote, about the militias that are on its borders. And so uh, the the problem is there's been a, a lot of tit for tat for the last six months between Israel and Hezbollah. Uh, again, all of this is Iranian directed and helped um, on the other side. And so um, Israel also has been saying, you know, we're going to go after the head of this octopus, not just its tentacles. And uh, that's when it attacked uh, the uh, Revolutionary Guard guys. So, you know, there is a sense in Israel that it is uh, facing an existential uh, struggle, that it ne if it can't allow its people to live within its borders, then it is not uh, performing the task that the state of Israel promises its citizens. So it's fairly uh, hawkish. We have a of have a very hawkish government here, uh, and Iran is also playing a very uh, a very delicate game here. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see where, where it goes. But uh, it doesn't look like either country wants a regional war, but of course, not wanting and happening are not the same thing. What does the U.S. do in this scenario? If a shadow war breaks into an open conflict, can it be de-escalated? Well, that's a great question. L let's start with what the U.S. is doing now. What it's doing is saying out loud to the world and to Iran, we stand shoulder to shoulder with Israel. If Iran were to attack Israel, we would view that as an attack on us. At the same time, Israeli dip uh, I'm sorry, American diplomats are making the rounds uh, by phone and, else and otherwise in the region to t get people to talk to the Iranians, to tell them to stop. Now, if there is an attack, it'll depend on what the attack is. I mean, if there's an attack on the state of Israel uh, with missiles or drones, uh, Israel says it's going to retaliate against Iran on its territory. And I think the Americans would be playing a role. That's what they've said. So now, would that lead to a genuine regional war? Who knows? Israel, in the meanwhile, s seems to be pausing the offensive on Rafa for now. What is the situation with Gaza at the moment, Ethan? So yes, we're in a pause moment. They pulled out the, most of their combat troops at the beginning of this week. Uh, they repeatedly uh, are asserting that the war cannot end until they have invaded Rafah, where they say four Hamas battalions are ensconced. But uh, what's, what we're waiting for is an attempt at a deal between Hamas and Israel for some kind of six-week pause or ceasefire. Now, yesterday, in addition to uh, these intelligence reports, there was an Israeli hit on the three adult sons of Ismail Haniya, a major leader of Hamas. So it's not like there's a massive de-escalation going on there either. There is still a lot of tit for tat and a lot of reason for concern. And oil, of course, did go up yesterday. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning on London DAB Radio, the Bloomberg Business app and Bloomberg.com. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day, right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.